Karen Thomas here to relate my near-death experience. My back injury and burst disc prevented me from working. I had a ruptured disc five years earlier, so I was worried about having a spinal fusion after the physicians concluded I needed surgery. It was unknown which operation I would have, and I asked friends and family to pray for me since I wanted to stay a physical therapist. The day of surgery, my spouse and two children joined me in the hospital. They followed my stretcher to the operating room suite because my surgery was one of the first of the day. Before I entered, they were sent to a waiting area and my stretcher was brought in past many surgical rooms. They entered my operating room. My physical therapist's job was at this hospital where I was operated, so I was familiar with it. For them to reopen my back incision, I had to lie face down on the operating table. They performed it, placed me under anesthesia, and I became conscious throughout the surgery. My consciousness was in a corner of the operating area near the ceiling. I heard the surgeon cursing and yelling at nurses to get blood transfusions while up there. It diverted my attention from the ceiling back behind me just in time to observe them flipping my body from face down to face up and recognizing that this was my body from a new angle. While this was happening, I felt calm and detached from my body, almost like it wasn't me, yet it was. The only thing that bothered me was the thought of my spouse, daughter, and son in a waiting room. I thought, if my consciousness is no longer in that body, I must have died, and I must get to them to tell them I'm okay. As I thought that, my awareness physically drifted past the operation room wall into the corridor. After passing all the other operating rooms and entering the operating suite, I came out into another hallway. As my consciousness moved, I heard a telepathic voice say, Pay attention to this man, and it drew my attention to my left, where I saw a man in street clothes rushing back the way I had come. As I was told to pay attention to him, I was able to zoom in pretty close and see what he was wearing, the colors of his clothing, his eyes, and his hair. I'm very nearsighted so to be able to see so closely was fantastic. I heard him thinking he wanted to get into the operating room immediately, so he kept speeding past. So I turned my attention to him in time to see another man, just in regular clothes, who was down near that area, and hear him think, that guy can't go in there. He's just a regular guy, and he can't go in where they're doing operations. The man I was supposed to pay attention to paused for a moment, and then double doors opened, and he rushed inside and closed behind him. My thoughts reverted to locating the waiting room, my spouse, daughter, and son, but before I could continue, I was dragged and stopped. I was literally lifted up through the ceiling of the floor I was on, the next floor, and out through the hospital roof into the sky above it. Then I was accelerated horizontally toward Anchorage, near this hospital. I was pulled into a dark, circular hole that appeared like a cave or tunnel as I crossed the city, which is on a bay, to cross the water. I moved very fast as I was drawn within, and it was dark yet far away. As I was drawn faster and faster, a pinprick of light seemed to grow as I got closer. In what felt like an instant, I burst into the light around the end of the tunnel. I was immediately flooded with love, peace, excitement, and unimaginable emotions when I entered this light. The light was everywhere, and I thought, well, where am I? So I turned my attention downward to see what I had arrived in, and I realized I didn't have any feet where I looked, and there should be feet, but there was a very brown and rocky ground, very desert-like arid ground, and that puzzled me because I thought, well, I've died. I must be in heaven, and somehow this doesn't look like anything I would think. Then another telepathic voice called to me from my left, saying, Follow me, and as I turned, I saw a man scrambling up a slope out of the region I had come out onto. After he said that I was behind him staring at him, or what I could see of him. He had virtually black hair that he pulled back and tied with what looked like leather, and he was wearing an off-white toga that ended midway down his thigh above the knee. Again, he wore a tie around his waist and shoes with crisscross ties below his knees. I felt like I should know who this person was and that he cared about me, but I couldn't. I was anticipating to see Jesus if I was in heaven, but I didn't think this person was Jesus. I didn't know who he was either. After climbing the slope, the environment became lush and verdant. The grass and many flowers spread around it looked illuminated from within and alive. It was amazing and I glanced ahead and saw lovely trees glowing and giving off light, and the leaves were too. I was entranced by the beauty of it all. 
The man who had asked me to accompany him had gone ahead, and said, Follow me again, and I was right behind him on the bank of a river, which was alive and glowing and sparkly like diamonds and beautiful. On the other side of the river, there were a lot of spiritual people, but I immediately recognized my father, who had died when I was seven, and my brother, who had perished in a vehicle accident. Then I realized that the other people there were my relatives who had all died at different times in my lifetime, aunts and uncles, and four people I had never seen or recognized but knew were my four grandparents who had died before I was born. They were all excited to see me, shouting, Oh look, she's here. Isn't it wonderful? I felt the same way as if I wanted to be across that ocean with them. I missed them terribly. The man I was following became my guide, and he telepathically said, No, you can't go there now. You have to follow me, and we have somewhere else you must go first. Since I couldn't control where my consciousness was moving and was being drawn everywhere, I was drawn behind him as he went down and around a river curve and into a huge opening with a huge building in the center. It was pearlescent white since it was glossy and lit up like everything else I saw there. After climbing these long stairs to the doorway, my guide said, follow me, and we entered. This massive edifice was inside a huge library with tables in the middle and volumes on each side. Scrolls were among the literature. I could see floors as high as I could see. It appeared like there was no ceiling. All these floors on either side were loaded with books. My guide said, this is the place where the books of life are stored, but we're not staying here. We have another place to go to. We traveled through this entire area and into a little hallway and then into a doorway to a smaller room. In this much smaller space, a group of spiritual beings were waiting for us around a wide circular area like a conference table. I didn't know who these folks were, how much they cared about me, or identify them. I felt like they helped me plan my life before I started living it. My guide then remarked, We're going to review your life, and a hologram appeared in the center of this large oval they were all seated around, allowing me to see my entire existence from birth to then. It went beyond viewing. I lived it, all my life's contacts with people. I felt like the other person during the interaction as well as everything else. If I was upset and shouted cruel words to someone, I would feel their hurt and my own fury. Or, if I did something kind and thoughtful without thinking, I felt how much that other person appreciated it. I saw the ripple effect of how that traveled through that individual to the others they interacted with and then to the ones they interacted with, creating this huge influence from small interactions in all these scenes. The most fantastic thing, where I would feel really badly about, oh, why did I behave like that? I could have done better than that. The spiritual people who were there with me gave me nothing but support and comfort and feedback of, you were learning. This is for you to learn even more about how important it is for everybody when they're interacting with other people. Then I was told, you can stay here if you want, or you can go back to your life if you want. But if you need to make that choice, we want you to see some of the things that will happen if you decide to go back to your life. Some of them are definite. Others are strong possibilities, but because everybody's got free will, the people that you might be going to interact with in your future might choose differently than what we're showing you here, and then the whole thing won't happen exactly as we're showing you, but we want you to be aware of these things before making your decision. I know that something else happened after I was shown the things about my future, but I have not been allowed to remember what it was. I then noticed that my guide and I are alone in a smaller room. My guide says, I want to show you the prayers of the people that are praying for you. Off to my right, I saw what looked like musical notes on a score of music. Whole notes, quarter notes, and half notes. Attaching one to another but not across the score, but upward closer to where we were. Though I didn't hear anything, I pictured those pleas as musical notes. My guide said, every prayer has its own unique vibration. Then he said, I want to show you what's happening in the waiting room in the hospital where your husband and your children are. This time, off to my left, I felt like I was above the ceiling, but it was clear. I noticed my hubby beside a doorway when I looked down. He was speaking to my surgeon, who was dressed in surgical gear. My two children were behind my spouse in the room. I was shown that my kid thought I died during operation, and the surgeon told my husband that. I learned she prayed for my survival when she was nine. The musical note prayer stopped with her prayer.
My emotions as a mother, wife, and physical therapist flooded me when that happened. I decided to return because I felt, oh, I must go back. I can't let my children grow up without their mother, like I grew up without my father. Then my guide said to me, you'll be able to remember almost all of what's taken place, and you'll have proof that this actually happened. But you won't be able to remember any of the things that we showed you about your future because if you did, then you would know. You would have lost your free will because you would be responding as though this is what you're supposed to do, as opposed to actively choosing it yourself. By then, I don't recall returning to my body. I only recall being in my body and waking up in recovery. I remembered this magnificent holy experience immediately as my spouse and children were alongside the stretcher. I felt calm, love, and joy filling me and a surrounding region, almost like a protecting bubble. I immediately knew it happened. Not being judged was huge for me. I was a practicing Christian and thought I would be judged for my sins if I died like I did. I was loved and supported, not judged. That contradicted my pre-experience beliefs. My deep idea that spiritual persons I encountered helped me arrange my life didn't mesh with my belief system either. Well, how could I plan my life unless I was there on the other side or in heaven before I even was born? That didn't fit my previous beliefs either. So much change and incorporating my experience back into my life. I became more aware of how crucial it was in every relationship and encounter, which affected my personality. I was critical, thinking, this is right and that is wrong, but the whole experience was so unlike from anything I had ever imagined, that clear-cut sense vanished. It altered me, and those who knew me before are attempting to relate to me now. I agree, it's hard when your whole worldview and beliefs no longer fit. Remembering that you won't be criticized, judged, or lacking after death is crucial. Your deceased loved ones will be with you. Complete acceptance and love await you. Realizing how much kindness and thoughtfulness mean to us in this life before we die is crucial. Not because you'll be criticized if you don't act that way, but because so much goodness flows out from you and through so many others as they spread kindness, love, and consideration. It creates a great, gorgeous experience right now. Not because if you don't do X, Y, and Z, you won't have a wonderful afterlife, but because if you do them politely and deliberately, your life and many others will be more beautiful. That alone is wonderful. A global great awakening is happening now as we become aware of our own consciousness and divine spark. You mentioned Jesus. I think Jesus is crucial. I believe much of what he taught has been passed on and reinterpreted by other generations. His teachings have instilled terror, something he never meant. When individuals encountered Jesus, I didn't, at least not during the portion I can remember, they find him to be utterly compassionate and a brother to humanity. He often dubbed himself Son of Man during his preaching, thus I suppose he felt spiritually connected to us.